Welcome to our online service at Spearfish United Methodist Church found in Spearfish, South Dakota. We'd love to see you come and visit us sometime. Otherwise, we're happy to have you here worshiping with us online. This service, we're going to be talking about God's wisdom and how we can interact and uh, perhaps get a little bit of light into what God's wisdom is for us and how we can use that in the world today. So I hope you enjoy our worship. We're glad you're, you've tuned in and... Uh, Let's worship God together. Our first scripture comes from Matthew 5, verses 13 through 20. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. We invite you into a time of prayer. First, you should pray with, among each other in silence if you're by yourself. Think of what all you have to be thankful for. Think of the woes you have in this world. Think about the people in your life who need some prayer. Take that time to discuss with each other. Go ahead and pause this video now and come back when, you, when you're ready. Now join us in this responsive prayer. Gracious God, we are prone to point the finger at others and to pervert justice by exaggerated charges. We want the rich to feed the hungry, but not to share from our own provisions. We prefer charity in principle, but in practice evade our duty even to our own kin. Some of us live in half-empty houses while there are families crowded into rooms too small for them, if they have rooms at all. Forgive our failure to live up to the best we know and to let the oppressed go free, even after you have freed us. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Christ nailed to the cross attests the cost of God's love and forgiveness. Our faith is not built on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Our second scripture comes from 1 Corinthians 2, verses 1 through 16. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters. When I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, 
the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things that God has revealed to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness, and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So one of the things that Paul talks about in Corinth and the book of 1 Corinthians is he talks about worldly wisdom. And here's some worldly wisdom for you. It might take a moment for you to figure it out, but does anybody know that the last day of this year will be 1-2-3-1-2-3? Think about that for a moment. Worldly wisdom. Yes, yes, it will be. Mm-hmm. So the Corinthians, as we meet them in the first chapter, appear to have it all together. But the problem is they're not all together. They have divisions in their church. And Paul says there is one division that really matters, and that's a division between those who are perishing and those who are being saved. We looked at that last week. And the dividing line would be the cross and our response to the message of the cross. Do we see the cross as foolishness or nonsense? It just doesn't make any reasonable sense, so we're going to reject it. Or do we see it, even though we don't understand it fully, as the wisdom of God and the power to save? And that is kind of the dividing line. Paul's preaching in Corinth, um, or in Paul's ministry in Corinth, he came preaching and he preached one message. I want to tell you about a pastor who came into a church, and he was a new pastor, and he came to the church. They didn't know a whole lot about him, but uh, they had called him and asked him to come and and preach and to be their pastor. And so he came and preached a message, and the people thought it was a great message. Nice, Nice message, Pastor. We appreciate you being here. Welcome to our town. It's good to see you. We'll see you again next week. They came back next week, and... They came for worship, and the pastor led the service, and it came time for the sermon, and after the sermon was done, some of them said that sounded rather familiar. And they said, that's a nice, that's a nice sermon, pastor. We really appreciate that. Welcome to town. We're glad you're here. And they go through the week wondering, did our former pastor give us that same message? Was it? And they come the third week for, for services, and they... Um, sit through the worship service and the sermon comes up and the pastor gets up and they're like, that sounds just like last week. That's weird. So the fourth week comes along and and the same thing happens in the fourth week. It's like, you know, is that really, is he preaching the same sermon over and over? And they went to the leaders of the church and the leaders of the church went and approached the pastor and said, pastor, you know, we're, we're not sure because, you know, there's only a few of us that listen real closely, but, <laughs> but we think, we think, Pastor, that you might be preaching the same sermon every Sunday. Yes, I am preaching the ser- same sermon every Sunday. Well, do you only have one sermon? He says, no, I have plenty of sermons, and as soon as you get the first one <laughs> and start doing what I'm preaching... We'll move to the second one. And this is sort of what the Apostle Paul is saying today. He says, I just basically had one message for you. And the message was Christ crucified. 
And it's a message that he had to keep teaching them over and over because it was so hard for them to accept that. We talked about that last week, how it was foolishness for Greeks, how it was outrageous for for Jewish people to think that their Messiah would go to his death on a cross. And so Paul's joining in with with this preaching about Christ crucified, and I need to rewind just a little bit and give you just a little bit of the background about Corinth again. If you watch, if you binge watch TV, you notice that there's a little uh, blurb at the beginning that kind of gets you caught up, and that blurb is not always the same. You don't always get the same review. They want to bring up the things in that review that are going to apply to today. Well, I'm going to do that today with a little bit of this review. Corinth was a Greco-Roman town. It had Greco-Roman culture. It wasn't really Jewish. By no means was it Christian. So these were all new people who were joining the church. Now, as I mentioned a long time ago, or several Sundays ago, in the first sermon that I started repeating several weeks ago, um, that the people who settled in Corinth were former slaves. And they were former slaves who were given land. It was kind of like, uh, I'm not sure what you would call it, you'd be given a land grant or something like that, but it was in a city, and they gave them a certain amount of capital to start businesses and to, to get things going. And so these were upwardly mobile people who weren't used to having money. And so they started spending their money on everything that was new and bright and shiny, and that included their ideas and their philosophies because they had philosophers who would come in and share things, and they would put out their hat and expect some gifts from the people as a a result of that. And these people were always keeping up the appearances and keeping up with the Joneses. It was important to look like you were with it. Whatever's new and hip, the people in Corinth, they were all over it. And they wanted to seem like they had all the newest ideas. And so Paul, in the midst of this, is planting a church in Corinth as their apostle. And he's also serving as their pastor for several years before he moves on. And some people's perception about Paul's preaching is kind of like the perception that church had about that pastor that came in. This guy isn't nearly as good as the people we've heard out on the street. I mean, we've heard better poets and philosophers than this guy who's coming and leading this church. And they considered Paul to be one of many options, kind of like we have on Sunday morning. If we don't come to church, we could look on YouTube and find thousands now of different worship services that we would want to go to. Um, And so they begin to think of Paul as being illegitimate according to their own standards. Illegitimate as an apostle, illegitimate as a pastor. He's not a very good speaker, so, you know, we don't really get into what he's saying. And so Paul's response is here in this first verse that I want to share with you. I think I can share it with you. Maybe we're stuck. There we go. He says, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom, as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So Paul is saying to them, My focus wasn't on eloquence or human wisdom. My focus was on Christ crucified. That's what you needed to hear. Now, just let me take one more time out here, and it's to talk about a little bit about how Paul's speech is structured. Now, when we have a a rhetorical thing that we're doing or or a speech, we usually use this kind of an outline. You give an introduction, you have points A, B, and C, and then you have a conclusion. Everybody recognize that from your literature classes, your speech classes? It's a good way to present something. I remember my brother asked a a preaching professor, he said, how many points should a good sermon have? And the preacher responded, it would be good if it had at least one. (laughs) So what you see here, again, is introduction, A, B, C, and then conclusion. It's linear the way it's presented. Everything's building one thing on top of the other, and then we build the case, and we make the case, and then we bring the conclusion. So that was, that's the way our modern outlines work. Well, the ancients used a different way of outlining, and their outlining is a fancy word. You don't have to remember it, but it's called chiasmus. There's a symmetry to the outline, so I want to show that to you. Notice how you have point A, 
point B, point C, but then you go backwards, point C, point B, point A. And as you read through Scripture, <clears throat> you'll sometimes find that this is how many arguments, both in the Old and the New Testament, are presented. It's an ancient way of presenting a memorable presentation. And then what they usually do when they have something like this, you'll find it in the Psalms, you can find it in Genesis, you can find it even in Revelation, but what you do is you put the conclusion in the middle. So you have this stuff on the outside and the, the point that the writer or the speaker is trying to make is right in the center of that. So sometimes this was A, B, C, then C, B, A. Sometimes it was just two points and then it was A, B, B, A. And that looked something like this. But while we're on the topic of music for a moment, Songs often use this pattern. There was a song in the 80s by a band called Genesis. Some of you may remember them, but they had a song. It's on, it's on the right there. You can see A, B, A, C, A, B. And, we all, and the song gets sung, and they sing Abacab. And we all thought it was Abacab, but Abacab is actually a metric for a pop song. It means you have section A, section B, section A repeated, then section C is sort of a bridge section, then it goes back to section A and finishes with section B. This is a structure of a song. And so songs often use a pattern that is not like we have in that outline to begin with. Songs generally don't look like this. Songs look more like this, Singers look, and they look like that A, B, A, C, A, B. So Paul is using a pattern like that. Sorry for that long digression. But Paul is using a pattern like that to make the case to the people in Corinth. He's saying it's not human wisdom, but God's power that's at work. Here's how it works. Not with eloquence or human wisdom. Uh, we proclaim the testimony about God. And then in the center, you see, this is not exactly symmetrical, but in the center, you see, I'm going to preach nothing except Christ crucified. I came in weakness, fear, and trembling. And you might ask, well, how are those two statements connected? Because the two statements of A are connected. You see, not with eloquence or human wisdom in A, the first, and then A, the second, not with wise and persuasive words. You can see they're almost identical. B is very similar, proclaim the testimony about God. And then B on the bottom one, it's God's power. And in the middle you have Christ crucified and Paul coming in fear and trembling. So what Paul is saying here is that him coming in weakness and in trembling is like Christ's weakness on the cross. It's a weakness that is actually a power that is going to show God's power. You remember from a couple of weeks ago, we talked about that the foolishness of God was to have Christ on a cross. And in being on the cross, Christ identifies with the worst of criminals. So what Paul is saying here is Christ identified with you on the cross. I am identifying with you by coming in fear and trembling. Now, why do I say that? Because if you look at these verses here, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Christ Jesus and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and great fear and trembling. And in doing so, he relates to the Corinthians who were not much when they were called. They were not wise by human standards, not many influential, not many of noble birth. He's saying, I came and I got like you so that you could hear the message about the cross. I didn't come as one of these speakers. I came as one of you to be with you and to share with you the message of God's power demonstrated through the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, in the very next section, it appears that Paul contradicts his own statement. He says, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. It contradicts Paul's message of simplicity, the simple message being Christ crucified. But now he's saying, I do have a deeper message for the quote-unquote mature. He sets up another division, if you will, 
between infants and those who are mature. And we're going to talk about that next week. So next week we're going to talk about a second division that Paul makes between the mature and the infants. But it raises the question that Paul's going to deal with here is how can God's wisdom be known? Because he's pointed out through Corinthians that you're not going to get to knowledge about God through worldly wisdom. Because worldly wisdom, he says, led to the crucifixion of Christ. It led to the execution of an innocent man. And even worse than that, the craziest thing is, it led to the execution of God on a cross. Now we might say, well, we know better. We know better. We wouldn't do that. We'd recognize Christ if he came today. Our worldly wisdom would lead us right to God. But then you ask the question, well, what has throughout history our worldly wisdom led to? Now, we can say with some pride that our worldly wisdom has led to some pretty amazing accomplishments. We landed a person on the moon. We researched things. We, we, we have significant process, progress that has taken place. But at the same time, you look throughout history and you look at the nasty crusades. You look at the, <clears throat> the, the, wor the work of Nazi Germany in World War II. You look at the technologies of war and how we become more and more efficient at killing more and more people in war. On the one hand, we have medical miracles. But on the other hand, we have a deeply flawed system of health care. We have mass murders in schools and seemingly anywhere else. We have global disasters, we have wars and rumors of wars, all these things taking place. None of these worldly wisdoms lead us to God. The reality is we need help. We need a different way to find God because we're not going to find it through this worldly wisdom. Paul says that knowing God's plan for the world is something that comes through the Spirit. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, which is what I was just talking about, but the spirit who is from God so that we may understand what God has freely given us. God's spirit, Paul says, is available to us. And knowing God's spirit leads to understanding God's plan. That's where all this confusing stuff in there was about. He talks about how can anybody know what somebody else is thinking? How can we know what God is thinking? Well, we know what God is thinking by having God's Spirit within us. And so knowing God's Spirit leads to understanding God's plan. And the reason that some of the Corinthians don't understand this is because they have yet to receive God's Spirit. And instead, they're focused on the noise that surrounds them. They're surrounded by noise. I mean, are we any different? Remember last week I talked about the Isthmian games and how there was just chaos and all kinds of speakers and, and entertainment and jugglers and people trying to rip you off and others trying to sell you one thing or another. And uh, I think we have some of the same kind of thing. We have our poet philosophers on YouTube and TikTok. We have echo chambers that are accessible to us to, to convince us that whatever we're thinking is right, whatever other people are thinking is wrong. We have cable, satellite, streaming, podcasts, blogs. Worldly wisdom is everywhere and it's overwhelming. And oftentimes it leads to an absence of of spirit contact, all the noise around us, the busyness that we get ourselves into leads us into an absence of spiritual contact. Now, I'm not talking about spirituality here. I'm talking about prayer, reading, devotions, disciplines, slowing down for a moment, taking Sabbath so that we can hear the Spirit speaking to us. In the Old Testament and in the New Testament, in the Hebrew and the Greek, the original languages, the word for breath, spirit, is the same word as breath. Have you taken time to breathe? Can we slow down enough, just enough, so that we can breathe? Can we, through knowing the spirit, know God's mind in the midst of all the noise around us. 
You see, Paul says, and I think it's true today even, that God's wisdom appears to be human foolishness. It's not flashy. It's not powerful. It's not done by powerful people doing amazing things. It's by small churches doing great things together. Oftentimes we're drawn to politics because that's where we think the power is, but the power is within us in the Spirit. Those things are an illusion of power, but when we slow down and breathe, we can begin to feel the Spirit's power within us. God's reality is Christ crucified, saving the lowest of the low by identifying with them and dying for and with them. And it's also about saving you because God loves you. And so as we prepare for the table tonight, as we prepare to come and experience Christ's presence with us tonight, I would encourage you to breathe, to breathe in, to breathe out, to be, a, to be aware of God's presence with you in his spirit. Because each breath that we take is a gift. And God's spirit is also a gift. And you are God's gift filled with God's spirit. Amen. If a job, health insurance, and the mortgage are all you have to worry about, consider yourself lucky. Receive now this benediction. Go as a forgiven and holy people to do the will of the one who loves us unconditionally. Amen.